Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming in today. We've got a couple of special guests here. Um, it's going to be a presentation first, and then we're going to open it up for a roundtable discussion. And the topics today are really dealing with patents and trademarks and intellectual property type issues. So we've got a really great group of people here in the audience, ranging from our scientists uh, here at the Kansas Polymer Research Center. Uh, it's housed inside the Tyler Research Center, along with our economic development folks, most of the, uh, the Enterprise PSU teams also in the room. And then I also see some people from out in the community. And I've been told there's someone as, from as far away as Hutchinson here. Is that right? And that's great. Awesome. Thank you for being here. So um, rather than take much time, I'm Daryl Pulliam. I'm the executive director here in the Tyler Research Center. And it's my privilege to introduce the folks from the US Patent and Trademark Office. And Rebecca Fitchman and uh, Mark Radke uh, are here. And we're going to turn it over to them. And then following that, Sarah is here from WSU, who works on their um, entrepreneurial series and some of their lecture series. And she's going to say a few words after they finish. So Rebecca. So hello everyone, um, thank you for coming today. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late here. Um, we got, we got kind of lost on the rural <laughs> backroads here. Um, so uh, just to start off with, I'm not, how, how familiar is everyone with patents? Does anyone in here have a patent or trademark or anything or you do? Okay, so a few people. Okay, so you guys have all gone through this process uh, before. Um, I'm basically just gonna, you know, give everyone a little bit of a background on the different types of intellectual property uh, you can acquire, um, and then, you know, that can lead us off to the discussion afterwards for, I guess, kind of how your university can move. Um, okay, so, um, so first of all, to start off with. Um, Back in 2011, uh, President Obama signed the America Invents Act, and that allowed us to open up all of these new regional offices. Um, before that time, the Patent and Trademark Office operated only out of Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and with the opening of these offices in, uh, in Dallas and in Detroit and San Jose, um, and also the Rocky Mountain Regional Office, where we're coming uh, to you from today in Denver, um, these, these offices really help us uh, promote IP and I think, and hopefully you know, ec economic growth uh, throughout more of the country than we were able to before. Um, this, is, you know, this slide just kind of gives you a quick overview um, of the cycle of innovation. Um, now, why would you, why do you want to get a patent? Um, there are a lot of advantages, and, uh, and uh, so for the first five years from uh, the time a company or an individual uh, for a startup or a university requires its first patent, um, they see a large increase in uh, employment and also in a very large increase in sales growth. Um, and. And, I, and I'm sure you know you've seen uh, products advertised that uh, that say like patent pending or patented, and um, that's that's a good way to um, to you know to increase your sales. Sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. Um, after you receive your first patent, um, that greatly increases the likelihood of additional patents. Um, that is sometimes, you know, basically because you're more familiar with the process and, you know, kind of how to write and word things. Um, the more patents you acquire uh, also, also helps you increase your funding. The, uh, the more patents you get as well, it also helps increase your probability of uh, IPOing um, and in also increases your probability of acquisition. Um, so I, you, you want to use the IP strategy um, as a business strategy and I, you know, as a strategy for your university. Um, the, uh, obtaining a patent helps uh, 
you know, make uh, make your product more attractive to investors and buyers. I'm sure you all have seen on, you know, on Shark Tank <laughs> or um, other things, other uh, shows like that. Uh, if uh, if you go in and you tell someone you have a patent, they're gonna think, you know, like, okay, this, you know, they know this is a new idea, um, and they're more likely to, you know, want to invest in your company and in you. Um, IP, IP also, uh, you know, it definitely helps protect other people from coming in and trying to, trying to uh, like leverage off your idea. Okay, um, so when you start thinking about intellectual property, um, you, you first of all, you need to decide, you know, what kind of IP you would want to acquire. Um, and there are many different types. You know, there's patents, there's trademarks and service marks, uh, copyrights and trade secrets, and you need to determine what specifically applies to you. And uh, this, is, this is just, you know, kind of a chart that shows um, the, uh, you know, the protection for how long and of all the different types. And we'll go over that a little more in a minute. Um, one example of IP that everyone knows is the smartphone, and this has, you know, every kind of production possible. Um, trademark, you know, the trademark name is Apple iPhone software. Uh, there are utility patents for, you know, the different working parts of the phone, uh, your, your eyes henna, um, the battery assembly, uh, image processing and the power control. There's a design patent on the shape of the phone and the look. Um, trade secrets, uh, we, we don't really know what those trade secrets are. Um, and then there's copyrights on the more artistic um, aspects of the phone, so the ringtone and the software code and also the instruction manual which is written. Okay, so a uh, basic overview on what a copyright is. Uh, as I was saying before, a copyright is the production provided for uh, works of art and you know works of uh, of the written uh, like an, uh, authorship. Um, and the general duration for the life of a copyright is uh, the inventor's life plus seventy years, or author's life. Um, a trademark is any you know any symbol any any way you can really like brand your product um, so on the, on the bottom you know these are a lot of very common trademarks uh, Starbucks FedEx um, I think a famous trademark from Kansas is Pizza Hut right mm -hmm. that's from here um, yeah which yeah. Wichita State oh, okay <laughs> Um, and the term for trademarks is 10 years, and then you can, you know, pay for a 10-year renewal. And this is just, you know, this is trademark palooza. This is <laughs> all out there. I think Pizza Hut's on there. Um, trade secrets are any information um, that is not available to the public and has reasonably be kept, you know, has reasonably be kept secret. Um, these are, you know, like formulas, uh, the, you know, the recipe for KFC or the ingredients that go on Coca-Cola. And I'm sure, I'm sure you all have heard in the news, uh, you know, someone, someone that used to work at Coca-Cola or somewhere like that, or this is not, you know, a straight example, of it, but just things like this, someone that worked at a company and like they, you know, and they got fired, and they kind of stole the recipe, and they brought it out, and uh, and there used to not be very good production when that kind of, you know, when that happened. But um, in 2016, uh, this Defend Trade Secrets Act came into play, and now now there's more protection. Um, now you can can defend your trade secrets in court and prosecute those. Okay, now again, um, I already mentioned this, uh, but why would you get a patent? Um, well, it deters others from entering your market. Um, 
you can use it as collateral for funding and it can create revenue from sales or licensing. Um, this patent pending thing up in the corner, I want to mention that because because everywhere you go these days, it seems like you see a product labeled as patent pending, right? And that doesn't actually mean that the product has been patented. That means that the, the product has an application for a patent in the system, but that doesn't mean that it is new. So, um, so you really want to go for getting the patent and not just the patent pending. I think patent pending is more used as a marketing tool. Uh, this is the path to getting a patent. Um, you know, you first, you first of all, someone's got to have the cool idea. Uh, second, uh, you can file provisional or non-provisional. Provisional is basically um, the type of application you file just to get the filing date when you have the idea. Um, and then non, no, filing a non-provisional application uh, puts the the application into the pipeline to be examined and you know for us to determine if the idea is actually new uh, and novel and non-obvious. Are you going to talk a little bit more later about the timeline between provisional and actual patent that you have to file? Yeah yeah oh yeah we can I mean so you have a year from the date you file the provisional application to file the non-provisional. Yeah and what happens if you don't do that? Um, Yeah, pretty much. Do you have anything? Yeah, if you, I don't know if you want to say anything. Sure. So a provisional application is basically a, a placeholder application. It's a pretty low cost way of getting your foot in the door and, and you know, uh, making it clear to, to the patent office and anybody who's going to be coming after you that, you know, you were in possession of this idea, this invention at the time that you filed this provisional application. Um, it's designed to be a, a, a cheap sort of process, um, and the, the requirements for, for filing it are, are pretty simple. It's something that, you know, most of the people in this room would be capable of doing, um, you know, probably on, on their own. There, there are some pitfalls uh, that, that you, could, you could step in, um, but, but basically what it is is, is you, you can submit, you know, an academic paper with a, with a cover sheet and stuff like that. That's, that's one thing that's, that's done in provisional applications. You want to make sure anything that you submit is as complete as it possibly can be uh, because you're limited in terms of what you, can, what you can add in later on in the process if you convert that into a non-provisional application. Um, but the gist is, you know, it's, it's a quick and dirty way of getting your foot in the door. It's pretty inexpensive and it gives you that one year uh, to think about your strategy, decide whether or not you want to file a non-provisional application, right? It gives you some time to see how your idea is going to succeed or, or not succeed. Um, and you know maybe do some additional work to um, you know to to really turn it into a, a, a full product as opposed to more of the proof of concept idea. Uh, and so, if you if you decide not to file a non-provisional application off of your provisional, then that provisional application we say it just goes abandoned, um, and that's kind of the end of it. One of the key things to keep in mind with provisional applications is those never get examined by an examiner. And so a provisional application can never become a patent. You have to convert that provisional application into a non-provisional application. Um, that, that step, you're, you're, you probably are going to uh, want to have a lawyer assist with the preparation of that. Uh, and that non-provisional application is, is, when we talk about patent applications, generally we're referring to non-provisional applications. Those get examined by the examiner. Uh, those will typically become a patent uh, after the, the patent examination process is complete. And, um, and, and the, the, the non-provisional is kind of the key. And you can skip the provisional application step altogether, um, but you know, depending on your sort of business needs and, and, and where you are in, in monetizing the product and various other business concerns, you, know, you, you may or may not choose to, to do that step. Sure. Could you keep applying for the provisional application year after year? Uh, basically, no. Um, you know, f so for a non-provisional applications, for, for typical applications, we have ideas like continuing applications and, and other things like that where you can um, you know you can keep the process going if you're if you disagree with the 
answers that you're getting the opinion of the examiner who's examining it. A non-provisional, or sorry, a provisional application is, uh, you can't really do anything in terms of extending the life of it. Um, there's some interesting and somewhat vague legal questions about what happens if you, let's say you file a provisional application and it goes abandoned after a year. Um, that, that's never published. And so, you know, if you did come back again a year later than that, there would definitely be problems with that. Um, and it, it would not be recommended to, to, to do that procedure. That would be something to discuss with an attorney though. Um, so, you know, if, if you are on the fence and you decide to abandon your provisional application, generally that's gonna be less painful for you potentially in the future than if you filed the non-provisional application and that went abandoned. So non-provisional applications typically will be published and available to the public for inspection. And even if you decide to abandon your non-provisional application, the record of that will still be out there. It's a lot harder um, to dig into provisional applications. They're not secret or anything like that in, in a legal, in a, you know, a, they're not classified or anything like that. Um, but you, you typically can't inspect them as a member of the public. I know you had the non-provisional and the patent lumped in for your 20 years. What is the typical timeline for the non-provisional? It's 20 years from the application, from when, when you file the application. So it, 20 years ago or so, it used to be from the, there would be a clock that started ticking from when you got your application, from when you got your patent, rather. Um, and they changed that now. So it's, it's 20 years, give or take, from when you file your non-provisional application. Um, and so that means that the time that you spend applying for your patent are going to eat into that. There's a concept called a patent term adjustment without getting too much into the weeds. Uh, basically, if, if the PTO is responsible for a delay in granting you your application, um, we will add life onto the end of the application, moving you beyond that 20 year period. So, you know, if, if you think, um, uh, just to give you a rough idea about timelines, if you file a non-provisional application today and you drop it in the mail, depending on what technology area it's drawn to, uh, it'll be about a year to a year and a half before the patent examiner picks that up, searches it, and writes their opinion on it. Um, typically, that's gonna be uh, a, a rejection notice, um, or what we would call a, a an office action is the docu the legal document that the patent examiner prepares. And so that happens in, in the vast majority of cases. They are rejected the first time around for a variety of reasons. There's a number of legal hurdles that, that you and your attorney will have to jump over before a patent gets granted. Um, but if, if you get that, that rejection letter, that does not mean that you know your idea has been uh, you know, found to be unoriginal or that you'll never get a patent or that the government deems your idea to be somehow unworthy. Um, you know, what it really is, is it's the beginning of a negotiation process with the government where you are, um, you're, you're negotiating the scope of the intellectual property, right? How, how broad is this patent going to be? Um, is it going to be for, you know, uh, for the audience here, is it going to be, uh, forgive me, I haven't taken chemistry since high school, but you know, for an entire new class of, of, of polymers that have been discovered, or is it going to be you know, drawn to a very, you know, particular, um, a very particular substance that, that's been created? Um, you know, or, or even more particular than that, it, you know, uh, specific applications or applied to specific coatings or, or other things like that. Um, and so that, that's roughly the idea of, of, of the scope of the patent. So you want a, a patent that's as, as broad as you can possibly get it because that'll give you the most protection. That'll allow you to uh, exclude the largest uh, number of people who, who may want to, you know, uh, move into your space and, and, and uh, do do research and other work in in the field that you've discovered, um, and uh, you know the the patent office, the examiner is is acting on behalf of the you know the American people to make sure that what you ultimately get and the scope that you ultimately are granted is um, is fair and is you know commensurate with what it is that you've actually discovered. So um, that process, that back and forth process, typically will take uh, about another year and a uh, year and a half. And so if you dropped your application in the mail today, on average, very roughly, it would be about three years before you had a patent in your hand. There's no upward limit on how long that can take. It can, there are patent applications that have been pending for decades. Um, that's not common, 
but uh, you know, it, it, there's no real hard and fast yeah, rule about when you'll get a patent. We're sitting on a patent application right now that one of our lead scientists has been working on for how many years, Sarah? It's eight, eight, eight years. Wow. And we're sitting on rejection clauses right now that we've been working diligently with, with, with the attorney to go back and forth on. And we've spent upwards of, yeah, close to $100,000 wow. on this thing. And it's, it's one of those things where had we known some things probably different in the beginning, we would have taken a much different direction. Got it. So, so for us, it's really about understanding. That's really why I brought up the question about the timeline, is I yeah. think it's very important to understand that when you go down that process, there is a, a very undetermined amount of time that it takes really from a, from a provisional to full patent application. Right, and that's so that's why we have the uh, patent term adjustment program, and also we do have a lot of other programs in the works at the patent office right now that are supposed to cut down on the examination time, um, so that you know hopefully the like the cases where prosecution is going on for eight to ten years do not happen as much anymore. So, I'm sorry. I think it, it sounds like you applied before we started uh, a lot of these programs, and and some and sometimes you know it's just due to the subject matter. Sure. But. I mean, eight years, I think, would definitely be an outlier. Yeah. Um, you know, and I can't comment on the, the particulars of, of, of that right. one application, right. but, um, but that, that's a pretty long pendency. I, I would suspect that, you know, if and when that, that application were to issue as a patent, it would probably have a lot of value in the marketplace. And so that might be um, part of the reason is, is it, it sounds like it, it may be a a broader application, although there's a, uh, any number of reasons why, um, you know, prosecution could be pro uh, prolonged that long. One thing to keep in mind, too, is if you're working with your patent examiner uh, or your attorney's working with your patent examiner, if you decide to use an attorney, and you, you strongly disagree with the conclusions that the patent, patent examiner is drawing and you feel like your, your case has not been heard fairly, that's not the, the end of the road. The patent examiner is not sort of judge, jury, and executioner in this situation. Mm -hmm. as, with, as with any kind of legal proceeding, you do have rights to appeal. Um, and, and just to kind of give you a brief idea, this is something that I tell the uh, new patent examiners about to help them understand sort of the importance of their work. Uh, they're about three steps away from being potentially reviewed by the Supreme Court of the United States. So we have a bunch of judges um, in-house in who are sort of administrative law judges who uh, would be the first people who you would appeal a decision to that you weren't uh, happy with. Uh, after that, then it goes typically to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, that's a federal appellate court. And from there, it goes right to the United States Supreme Court. And so, um, you know, you always do have the, the right to appeal and, um, you know, th there are uh, less sort of formal mechanisms that your attorney can advise you of, which would involve sort of basically calling the examiner's boss and saying, you know, can, can I just get a sanity check on this? They're not gonna re-examine the case and generally they're going to, you know, but they can help you maybe understand a little bit better the examiner's perspective and, and why it is that they're, um, they've come to the conclusion that they, they came to. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome to stay up here, Mark. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right, um, from this, uh, so you just talked about how long patent protection lasts. Uh, you know, it's 20 years. Um, uh, what, uh, what can and cannot be patented? Um, but you know, any, uh, I'm blanking right here. Uh, there's a, there <laughs> what can and cannot be patented is, is an interesting question, especially in the age of, of software related inventions. Um, this, this might seem like sort of a, a mundane question, and for a long time, the courts considered it to be pretty settled law. Uh, at one point, the rule was that, at, that anything under the sun made by man is eligible for patent protection. Um, but uh, now in the area of software law, there, there's been some changes, and, and it's become uh, more difficult uh, to patent things like software. It's software not impossible. Software and natural products. And, and natural products, which is something that might be more um, pertinent to, to this audience. If, uh, it, it would be a question to ask an attorney, uh, you know, if you do have some kind of um, new uh, chemicals that are derived from things that are naturally occurring. Um, if you're doing anything in the area of genetics, there's also those kinds of questions that come up. Um, it's a pretty weedy subject. 
um, as you might guess. But if you're if you're working in a lab and you're you're mixing chemicals together, you're probably going to be uh, pretty safe from from a patent protection standpoint. Yeah, and then uh, as far as cost goes, uh, as you heard over here, getting a patent is pretty expensive, especially if uh, especially if you're using an attorney. Um, we do have a pro bono program. Um, that can help people out, and I think I think the qualification for individual inventors for that is, um, I think you have to make I think less than three times the national poverty line, which is like, I don't, it's like We've thirty got five. Other slides. We'll, yeah, we can come back okay. to that. Anyway. One, one interesting thing on the topic of who can apply for a patent. This is just more of a fun fact than anything else. Uh, you might think that you have to be over the age of 18 or something like that to sign all the legal documents that are required. Uh, that's not in fact true. Any, anybody uh, of any age can be an inventor on a patent application as long as they can sort of understand what it is that they're doing when they're filing that application. So don't think that applies to anybody in this room, but if you have some family members that you're talking to at a barbecue and they have a great idea, you know, don't discourage them just because they're, they're young. <laughs> Um, so we already touched on this a little bit, uh, what types of things you can patent. Um, I think what we haven't discussed so far is that, and a lot of people don't know, is that you can actually get uh, a patent on plants <laughs> as long as they're asexually reproduced. Um, uh, just go back one what, second. So uh, there's three main types of patents. There's utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. Um, when we talk about patents, uh, we are referring to utility patents. The vast majority of patents are utility patents. Uh, design patents have to do with, with ornamentation. Uh, so for example, a hood ornament, uh, uh, Becky had talked about the, the shape of the, the iPhone and the, the case and everything like that. That's another common example. So uh, it, it's, it's ornamental design as, as opposed to function. And you can, you can imagine there might be some areas where that overlaps, right? If you put um, some, some grooves on the side of the phone to make it easier to hold, well then is that a, an ornamental design because it looks nice and it's wavy or is that a functional design because uh, it improves the, the ability of the user to, to hold and manipulate the, the phone. So, um, you know, the, the lines get a little blurry here. Plants are a little bit easier. Um, <laughs> the plant patents are, are probably the smallest niche of these. I've never actually met a plant patent examiner. Um, <laughs> Uh, common examples of plant patents include varieties of roses and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, you know, like the russet potato, I think that there's a, right, <laughs> there's a patent on that. Um, let's see. We'll research that in time for our, our Idaho trip. Yeah. <laughs> These are, I mean, these are all the considerations we've uh, brushed on most of these uh, for deciding whether you need to get IP protection, um, cost, your time. Uh, you need to determine if you also want to get international protection, um, and you can, you know, get this through filing a PCT. Um, you need to determine if you want to go provisional, non-provisional, and then if you want to hire a patent attorney or agent. And again, you can you can go through this whole process without an attorney. Uh, it's not recommended as it's not easy to navigate the whole process, but it is possible. So to, to talk a little bit about costs, just to give you a, a rough ballpark, um, the fees that you end up paying to the patent office would be uh, a fraction of what you would probably be paying to uh, total if you decide to hire an attorney. The attorney's fees would be uh, typically be the bulk of the, the costs associated with filing uh, an application. And one thing that Becky alluded to that we'll, we'll get into um, in a little bit is, is we have some good uh, discount programs so uh, for small businesses and um, you know sort of what we call small inventors or you know uh, people sort of working in their garage or in a maker space, those kinds of things can get a 50 or even a 75% discount on fees that are paid to the patent office. Um, we also have something called the, um, the Pro Bono Assistance Program, which we talked about, which uh, is, is a program by which the, the PTO acts as a clearinghouse to connect uh, people of limited means to attorneys who are willing to do the, the work of patent prosecution for them for free. Um, if you can sit back. On the topic of international protection, it's important to know that there's no such thing as an international patent. 
Uh, every country has its own patent regime. And so if you are going to be doing business internationally, you can imagine that your costs are going to increase uh, exponentially, right? So, um, you know, if you want coverage in Japan, Korea, um, Europe, and South Africa, for example, if those are the main places where you expect to do business or where your competitors may be located or where uh, those are the countries where they have the greatest capacity to um, potentially manufacture and infringe on whatever it is, the specific type of product that you're making, um, you might want to consider international protection. There are ways to make it easier to obtain patents internationally. That's called the uh, uh, PCT application, Patent Cooperation Treaty. So that's an, an international treaty that's been signed on by pretty much every single country in the world. Um, certainly all of the largest economies in the world and many of the smaller ones. It's some, I think it's over 200 countries yeah. that are involved. And so what, the, uh, what a PCT application allows you to do is uh, all these countries have gotten together and said, if you meet these basic requirements for an application, then we will uh, accept this sort of, um, this single application format within our country's patent system. So rather than having to worry about 200 and whatever different application formats and languages and filing processes and a million other considerations, uh, that come up anytime you're dealing with a government bureaucracy, it would be uh, one single application that you can file with basically any, um, any patent office, and that becomes a, a parent application that can give birth to, uh, you know, quote unquote, real applications in any number of countries. So, um, you know, you, you, you create these applications in the countries that you want to file it in, and you point back to this PCT application that you filed. The PCT application is basically never going to become a, a patent because, again, there's no such thing as an international patent. Um, however, it can make the filing a, a lot easier. It can also buy you time to decide, you know, what are the countries that we want to pursue this in. Again, it, this, this is uh, a way of, of getting you a delay to see how your ideas are going to take off in the marketplace, where you're at financially in terms of what, what you can afford and, and, and all those kinds of factors. Um, a quick word, uh, we talked about patent agents a little bit. Uh, um, in order to practice before the, the patent office in the US, uh, in order to be a patent attorney, um, you have to not only go to law school and pass the bar exam the way a, a, a traditional attorney would, um, there's also additional requirements and an additional bar exam that you, is required before you can practice before the, the patent and trademark office. And so typically a patent attorney is somebody who has gone not only to uh, law school and passed the, the bar exam, they've also got a, some kind of hard science background. Uh, a lot of us are engineers. Um, and so you know, that, that's highly specialized kind of work and a lot of years of school is, is I'm sure many of you can sympathize. Uh, and so a, a patent agent is sort of, uh, uh, has, has met those requirements but never went to law school. So a patent agent is somebody who uh, typically is an engineer or has a hard science degree, and then they've taken that bar exam. So they can do work for you. Um, they can follow your application with the patent office. They can get you to that step, but they're not an attorney, so they can't advise you once you get your patent, you know, that somebody's infringing it and take them to court uh, and those other factors. So a uh, patent agent will typically be a little bit less expensive than a patent attorney, um, although they'll, when it comes to getting you the patent, they'll typically have a similar amount of experience as a patent attorney would. We might kind of want to zip through. Yeah. So we have, do we have questions? Yeah. Um, you said there is no international patent. Uh, I know uh, that there is something called World Patent. Uh, patent, the US patent, the US. And there is also World. Uh, there, there is WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. They don't grant patents. Um, they're m more of a body that um, uh, makes suggestions and serves as a forum for member states to, uh, to discuss patent law, ultimately with the goal of, of harmonizing IP law. When we talk about harmonization, we mean 
Um, you know, we, we talked about all these different intellectual property regimes that exist in all the different countries. Uh, what WIPO does is it tries to um, make those laws more consistent between countries and, and come to some sort of consensus. Um, and, and WIPO is also an, an organization with which uh, you can file a PCT application, I yep. believe. Yep. Um, and so you mentioned Europe also. So, I mean, Europe exists, as we know, sort of in a weird state right now where it's, it's sovereign entities, but a lot of their their legal regimes are, are unified, and so the, there is a, an entity called the European Patent Office, which would allow you to basically, I'm not an expert on this subject, but basically get a patent that's enforceable across most of the EU member states, and um, uh, so in, in that sense, that would be a sort of international application uh, patent uh, within the EU. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, so throughout the whole patent process, I would like to encourage you guys, and it sounds like you do, but uh, definitely like try to work with the person that is examining your application. Um, you can have interviews almost at any step of the process with your examiner, um, and it's it's really helpful if the inventor is in on that, and not just the attorney, because there's there's always some kind of disconnect. Uh, you know, between like the attorney wants to the attorney wants to give you as broad of protection as possible, um, but then you know you don't end up claiming what what's actually inventive, um, and there's there's always some kind of disconnect, and it's a lot of times way easier to hash this out over the phone, and most most of the examiners at the office are more than willing um, to help you out with these kinds of things, so it is really really beneficial to just get on the phone with these people if you can, um, and you you have to you do have to have the meeting through your attorney. If you if you have an attorney, you you can't just call them up as the inventor, um, and it, and you, and if uh, and if you can't you can't work out a solution, you know at the end like we don't like to push people towards this, but there's always the appeal process uh, afterwards if you're adjusting uh, if it if the examiner says no a final time, you know, and then someone else our judges will review the case uh, and then you can move forward that way as well. So uh, another large cost as far as patents go is the maintenance fees. Um, it's actually a lot more expensive to maintain your patent and pay those uh, yearly fees. I think there's a fee after, th for the first year, there's like a three year fee, seven three year half, fee. Seven and a half, yeah. And a half. Uh, so yeah. The, the idea here is that uh, once you get your patent, you're not automatically going to be, uh, have that patent for that, that 20 year period that we were discussing earlier. Uh, you do have to pay fees to maintain it. Uh, you might ask why that is, and, and what, the, uh, what Congress was trying to incentivize when they created the maintenance fee system uh, is to encourage people to actually be using their ideas and bringing them to market, right? So um, if you get a patent, you have every right to essentially sit on it. Um, however, uh, at that three and a half year mark after you get your patent, I think it's seven and a half and eleven and a half, you have to pay a series of escalating fees in order to keep that patent alive. And the idea there is, you know, let's say you get a patent and you decide not to bring it to market. Um, you know, that's that's running in some ways counter to the ideas of, of the patent system, which are to encourage innovation, encourage to bring new ideas to market, et cetera. And so, what uh, what they what they do is they they make you pay to keep that patent uh, alive, and by making the fees escalate, they want you as a patent holder to ask yourself every couple of years when these fees come due, you know, do I, do I want to maintain this right or um, do I want to let it go abandoned? If you let it go abandoned, then uh, it basically becomes part of the public domain and anybody who, who comes along can, can make and use and build on that idea because you've given up that exclusive right. And this goes back to the core of the patent system, right? It's not just to, um, to protect inventors and reward inventors by giving them a monopoly on their idea, once that, that limited term of the patent, about that 20 year period, once that lapses, then it becomes part of the public domain and anybody can make or use it. So that's, that's the, the quid pro quo at the core of the patent system is, is once you've, you've had this, this limited period of time to make as much money as hopefully you can um, off of the idea, then you have to give it back to, to the world and it becomes part of the public domain. So maintenance fees are a way of, of, uh, of, of in some ways hastening that process. So these are sort of the responsibilities that you would have as a patent owner uh, once you've got your patent. So in addition to paying your maintenance fees to keep it alive, um, you know, you, you have to let us 
uh, ideally you would let the patent office know if you sold that patent. So a patent is a property right just like, um, just like anything else. So just like you could sell somebody a car, you could sell somebody a patent. Um, there's an opportunity to make limited sorts of corrections or even more substantial ones. Uh, if, you, you know, if you get your, your patent and it issues and you notice a typo in it, that's a pretty easy fix. Uh, if you disagree over the scope of the patent protection that you were given, that's a much uh, harder fix, and, uh, but it, it can be done. Um, and then there's the post-grant review process, which is a, uh, a relatively new um, uh, process in, in the patent system. And the idea there is to, uh, if, if you are uh, litigating a patent, if somebody accuses you of infringing a patent, and you're in federal district court and you say, no, this patent should never have been issued anyway. It's a way of getting the patent office to sort of look at the patent again, uh, maybe in light of some new evidence that you're aware of that the patent examiner wasn't able to find and, um, and, and do that at a much less cost and we like to think with a much higher degree of expertise in the subject matter than um, a jury of your peers at a federal trial. Um, as those of you who are scientists and researchers know, Explaining what it is that you do to your family um, over the holidays is, is sometimes a daunting task. And so <laughs> we have, you know, we like to think that we have a lot of that expertise in house because we all have the, the science backgrounds. And when you're dealing with stuff like uh, chemical sciences, most of the patent examiners and judges who work on those areas have, have PhDs or, or other graduate degrees. Uh, this uh, this is just you know a slide to show you all the uh, the resources we have for different startups, um, and uh, you can just you know go to this website and these are resources for everyone actually. Um, but you know for any any questions you have along the way, we have you know an assistance center for uh, patents and for trademarks and. Um, we we have a lot of we have a lot of like web resources that kind of you know give you the basic info you need to get you moving along the way. And one of the best resources that you have is is Becky and I and the rest of our our office in in Denver. Um, you know, hopefully if if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you want more information on anything that we've talked about or didn't talk about, um, you know, get in touch with us. We, we sort of act as an ombudsman for folks in the region here and, you know, I'll help get you answers. Uh, you know, if, a, if an application becomes um, stuck or falls into a black hole or you're, you're just frustrated or you want to know what your options may be in any given situation, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to, to talk with you and act as a liaison with any of the various components of, of our agency. Um, you know, if you go to that startups um, website or anywhere else on our website, you can find uh, a list of 30 different phone numbers that you could call and it might not always be clear who the right person is to contact. So you can always reach out to your regional uh, patent office and, and we can help you with any of that. Um, this is, uh, so this is one of the programs uh, we have initiated somewhat recently to help the patent, uh, the patenting process from filing to allowance or disposition go a little bit faster uh, to prevent the like eight to ten year time frame. Um, this is our track one program and the goal of this program is to go from the beginning to the end of the process within 12 months. Um, of course you have to pay a little bit of extra money to do this. Uh, good news is that, um, so specifically for here, um, most, uh, I think you qualify for as a micro entity, a higher ed micro entity. Um, uh, so, and I think on the next slide, so for a micro entity, the fee is only a thousand dollars compared to the four thousand dollars that it would normally cost to submit the track one request. Um, so, uh, for a higher ed micro entity, um, it's, I guess it's, it would be the inventor applying. Um, they would have to, you know, have a job that is at least 50% of their income uh, coming from the university. Um, and then the invention is also uh, licensed or assigned to the university, um, but then it would still, you know, as normal 
the inventor's name would be on the patent. But but good news is that for you know institutions of higher education, uh, you, they can generally qualify for the for the micro entity. So there, there's two concepts that are kind of wrapped up here. So the, this concept of a micro entity is a uh, it's a, a discount system. So uh, we have sort of three tiered pricing. So there's there's large entities. That's the traditional fee if you're a General Electric or a Facebook and you're filing a patent applications. And they in some ways subsidize the application process for for the little guy, for um, so educational institutions who qualify um, and, and other um, other entities. So for a long time we had we had large and small entities and so small entities receive a 50% discount so anything that qualifies under the small business administration's definition of a small business would probably qualify uh, as a small entity. We recently added the micro entity status which is a 75% discount and and that's pretty much individuals. Anything that you're doing on your own um, you know again uh, hacking in your garage on the weekends, that kind of stuff, uh, would, would typically qualify as, as a micro entity. So, so that has the, the, the micro entity status has to do with the, the fee structure. Um, on the previous slide, there was also a discussion of the track one program. Um, as we said, if you file an application today, it would be anywhere from a year to 18 months before the examiner even picked that up. What uh, getting track one status allows you to do is, is essentially pay money to move to the front of the line, or at least move to a smaller pile, as it were. Um, and the, the goal there is that the examiner will review your application, you know, like we said, um, usually the examiner rejects the application the first time he or she picks it up. Uh, then you and your attorney would work to file a response, and then you would get a second um, either rejection or, or notice of allowance uh, from the examiner at that point. And so the goal of the track one program is to take that whole process uh, from filing your application, getting your, your first action, you filing your response, and getting uh, a final decision um, from your examiner within 12 months from when you file. And we meet that target in the vast majority of cases that are submitted under the track one program. And so uh, in the beginning here, Becky was talking about the, the value of having patents to a startup and, and how much, uh, uh, having a patent under your belt uh, can can improve your or is correlated with improved outcomes for for the startup, um, and so by by really tightening the amount of time that it takes to get that first patent, ideally, um, you know it, it can can really drive a, a, a small startup. Yes. Uh, you mentioned employee here. A let's say the university example. If a student comes up with an invention, you consider a student as an employee or there's a different situation? Yeah. Actually, broaden it just to student, staff, or faculty, uh, in my mind, is what I was thinking of Kawan, is would that qualify at this institution for that program? That's a tricky question. So <laughs> you, you have agreements and students have agreements with the university regarding um, the ownership of intellectual property that's created um, when they're doing work in, in research labs or, you know, everybody, even if you don't work for the university here, um, you presumably have some sort of employment contract. And, and if you work for a, a medium or large size business, that's gonna be well defined. Maybe they gave you a dollar on your first day as a token uh, and, and they said anything that you produce uh, IP wise um, while you're employed here we own. And a lot of people don't realize what they're signing away when they, they do that. Um, the structure of, of agreements between universities and students who are maybe using their lab equipment, um, it, I, I don't know the particulars of, yeah. of, on, of his first statement. On the previous slide, under track one, you said it had to be named in the name of the event, in, of the inventor. So. For Or uh, where, where are you talking uh, here? Uh, yeah, so application must be filed in the name of the inventor. Oh, that's for, for yeah, that, that's sort of a formality. They're, you're always going to have them listed as an inventor. Um, I'm, I'm, I would say that a student would, would more likely than not qualify as a micro entity, whether they would qualify under the higher ed um, caveat or whether they would just qualify under ordinary income requirements. 
um, would be a, a discussion to have with the attorney, but I, I think if their experience in college was anything like mine, they would qualify as a micro. <laughs> um, so there, there's other ways, this is to say, there's other ways of qualifying as a micro entity. Um, because of the audience that we're talking to here today, we're focused specifically on the higher ed um, exception for that. But uh, as Becky said earlier, um, there, there, there's a, um, a different way of qualifying, which is based on, on multiples of the federal poverty index. And I know I would have qualified as a student. Absolutely. So one thing to, to think about and a discussion that, that you, know, you all may want to have as a, as a university is ownership of intellectual property. Um, that's something uh, that was a popular topic um, in, in, in Denver because there were students at, um, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was CU, who, uh, you know, as part of their senior capstone project, they created something that they felt like had a really good chance of succeeding in the marketplace. And then they found that um, the, the agreement that they signed with uh, CU when they started as freshmen said that CU owned a, a, a very significant percentage of, of that idea. And there's ways that you can negotiate and work with the university to get out from under that agreement, um, you know, and, and, and discuss what is a fair and equitable ownership stake. But there are universities, and I don't mean to single out CU for this, but there are universities that have what um, students would consider to be fairly onerous requirements on them and, and what students would consider to be sort of unreasonable requirements. And so. Um, it's it's a it's a discussion worth having and and you know uh, everybody should understand sort of their rights and, and and where they stand and some universities don't have policies uh, don't have stated policies and you know it's an opportunity to um, to to make some of those things um, explicit and, and and put them down and make sure everybody's apprised of of where they stand. But it, yeah. If a student comes up with an idea and he is in college and he suppresses that idea until he gets out of the college, <laughs> does that leave him liable to the college or not? You're, you're all asking <laughs> hard questions. All right. Um, as a general rule, anything that could be considered work for hire um, is the, the IP rights uh, would revert to the person who hired you, right? So if you were to argue that students are employees of the university when they're doing work in a research lab, for example, um, then there's an argument to be made that anything that comes out of that would absolutely be owned by the, the university. Um, I think in... in um, the university would have to be the one to come argue against that, though. I mean, if they well, were yeah. challenging that, in that case, that person leaves the, you know, the institution and goes out and sits down and writes a utility patent there unless the university would pull back and push back against that there's a couple different ways that the university could go about doing that right like so let's say the the student the former student went out and, and got a patent and started a company and you know all that and and the university didn't become aware of it until they were on tv trying to get mark cuban to buy it <laughs> um you know at that point um you could say that this is all sort of a fruit of a tainted tree, right? Like we, we, we were and remain the rightful property owners of this because at the time that you developed it, you were doing it in our lab and you had these clear agreements. And so, you know, you, you've basically failed to, you know, put us as owners when you filed the patent application. And, and just like any property, right? If, if, I, if I steal your car, you can go to court and you can get me to give the, compel me to give the car back to you. Um, you know, it would be a similar, it would be an analogous situation with um, sort of an ill-gotten patent. So the courts can always provide, in theory, could provide some kind of remedy to reassign the ownership rights of that patent to the university, if the university is in fact the rightful owner. There's also arguments that the student could probably make that they're not an employee, that the use of the lab equipment was, was sort of incidental. Um, you know, maybe they owe you, uh, they would owe the university a couple bucks for some resistors and a breadboard or something like that, depending on sort of the, I think the complexity of the, the, the invention of discovery would probably come into it too, right? If it requires a sophisticated research laboratory um, and weird reagents and all that, then that's probably more likely that the, the student couldn't do that without the university being there. But, um, that, that's pretty, pretty rare. Generally, if, so the way you phrase the question kind of leads to the answer too, right? 
the student intentionally suppressed it. Well, if you're suppressing your findings, um, you know, that shows that you've probably not got the cleanest hands in the world. <laughs> but if you are working for a company and you sign an agreement when you go to work there as a janitor, let's say, and you've got a, you just see something that happens, quit the company. You can go out and, and reinvent something without being uh, liable to that company. Well, it depends on the what you're sort of stealing. Um, if you're stealing trade secrets, then you're probably... No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about stealing anything. If I'm a janitor has a great idea while well, he's just working and I know doing his duties or her duties? Worked at this company that I worked for. Had a good idea, presented it to them three or four times, they wouldn't listen to him, so I went to work for another company, and then they developed that idea. There's no nothing wrong with that. That's a thorny topic, though, right? Because they, assuming they developed that initial idea um, while they were employed by that first company, even Nobody if a, even if a company doesn't decide to do anything with the intellectual property rights, they still own that, right? So intellectual property is a broader concept than just patents. Intellectual property is also sort of the idea at the core of it. And so, Would there also be a question of public disclosure at that point as well. Uh, if they're disclosing so, that idea. So public, so so disclosure becomes important for a lot of timelines and, and stuff like that. And um, that probably wouldn't be a public disclosure though. If you're just pitching it to your your boss in a meeting, that would probably, it would almost certainly not be a, a public disclosure. However, if you were in a format like this or at a conference or something like that, and you said, I've got this this idea and I'm, I'm trying to get some funding to, to go in this direction and um, you know I'm, I'm struggling with it um, that might be sufficient public disclosure to meet that requirement in general you want to be very uh, go, going off of sort of typical contracts employer contracts and stuff like that you you, you want to be very careful about doing anything like that where where you say well I'm going to go do my own X without you um, there's a lot of red flags there that could come back to bite you if your idea takes off and your former employer thinks that you uh, you did something shady for lack of a better term. The first question that the lawyer that I talked to about a patent was first question have you told anybody about this? It's a good place a to good start. Good first question. First question. <laughs> and I said, no, I just thought of it on you know, this morning. Yeah. And from there, we went down the road of getting the patent. And that's become uh, very important in the last few years. So for, for a long time, the, the U.S. was what's called a first to invent system, where um, you know, if, if we both have the, uh, a great idea around the same time um, and there was a question about who was the, the, the true inventor, um, we would go back to lab books and, and notebooks and, um, you know, any other kinds of records and artifacts that were, were created and the courts would, would look and say, you know, no, this is the date on which uh, Becky first put down the idea for the telephone. Um, and Mark was two weeks later, so we're going to give her the rights to the patent for that idea. Um, as part of the effort to harmonize our system with other systems, there was a, a law passed a few years ago called the American Vents Act, which we discussed earlier, which has changed the United States to what we call a modified first-to-file system. So first-to-file systems are very common in other countries in the world that's sometimes referred to as a race to the patent office. So if there was a dispute as to ownership under a first to file system, um, it would, we would look at the, the date on which the letters were postmarked, essentially, I'm, I'm being a little bit informal here, um, and, and that's the person who, who would win that dispute. It's whoever, whoever slides their, their papers under the door at the patent office first. That's, that's mm -hmm. what we've been led to believe in, in, in the last couple of years of everyone we talked to is it's first it's the first to file a provisional get that provisional file get a date stamped and then work through your and application. yeah and and 
I think most people would say generally that's the best policy. Um, we do have a little bit of, of an asterisk there where there is a one year grace period um, uh, to, to file your application as sort of a, uh, a, I think a little bit of a trade off to people who, who are more familiar with the, the first to invent system. Uh, but I don't think many people would recommend relying on that grace period um, for, uh, for the sake of, of um, protecting your idea. So for example, you know, um, and this may be something that you've heard, if you're going to publish um, or you're going to present at a conference your ideas, you, you, you want to have the conversation at least with the lawyers about whether or not you, you should file a provisional application before doing so. Because the minute that you're out there in, in a public forum, um, and this would certainly qualify as a public forum for just for, for an example, um, you know, you, you begin, if, if you don't lose rights entirely, you, you start a lot of clocks ticking that potentially cause you to lose rights. And the other thing to think about, we were talking a little bit about international protection previously, um, and I said that in, in a lot of foreign countries, it's a strict um, first to file rule. And so if you're seeking protection outside of the United States, um, and they don't have that grace period, um, you may be giving up rights um, without knowing it. So um, that's, uh, those are some important considerations. And so, I mean, I think a lot of attorneys would give advice similar to yours, is, is err on the side of filing that application um, rather than, you know, waiting um, until after you've disclosed it. So when you get a patent and you have the opportunity to file for that international properties or whatever it is, doesn't mean you get a patent, but it gives you the opportunity. How long a period is that before you lose that opportunity? So you're typically you're going to want to file that PCT application, um, you know, around the time, let's say, um, of the the filing in the U.S. You don't. It would probably be a bad idea to wait until after you have a U.S. patent patent to file that PCT application, um, because again, the PCT can become a parent application for your U.S. application too, just as it could in any other member country. And so, um, the typical way that uh, people proceed is they file the PCT application and then they file the U.S. application as a child off of that, um, that PCT. Um, rough timelines for all of that, 12 to 18 months after filing that PCT application to make decisions about filing in member countries. We, you know, we're kind of torn here because on the one hand, we're, we're a bureaucracy that generally moves slowly and wants to carefully deliberate over the ideas that we're, um, we're examining. On the other hand, it's in the interest of business for us to deliver patents to you as quickly as possible. Um, so it's kind of competing concerns at times. So you can't you can't actually choose um, where your patent gets examined. It will you know you'll apply and it'll get forwarded to the right examiner. Um, well, if how, you how does that happen? I guess would probably be a better question. I'm curious how it gets to the examiner. Uh, qualified examiner. Um, well, so you just file online, and we are as examiners we're grouped into different technology areas. Like I'm a I'm a chemical engineer, so. I, I examine a lot of like medical diagnostics um, and there are other people that specialize more in software. There's, you know, special art units for boxes. So we, we are grouped at the patent office and they, um, we have a classification system. Uh, we use CPC right now, um, which is the same, what? Stands for. Oh. Um, Combined patent yeah. cooperation. Yeah, no. cooperation, yeah. Yeah, oh boy, <laughs> sorry. Um, so when we file a patent, it goes to one central clearinghouse. Right. So yeah. Like your regional office for this. No. So, so you it's one location. What happens if if you drop it in the mail or you file it online? It goes to our our central filing group. There's a group of 
paralegals who review it for sort of formal requirements, make sure you're checking all your boxes, make sure all the pieces and parts are there, um, make sure you paid your fees. Um, and then um, the case gets classified into various technology areas. Examiners work uh, at very fine levels of, of granularity in terms of the technologies that they examine. So uh, Becky talked about uh, what, what she works on. When I was a patent examiner, I worked on patents, uh, patent applications related to databases and search engine file systems. There's a group of about 10 examiners, 10 to 15 examiners, who work full-time year-round on beds and pillows. <laughs> um, and so you know, there's, there's 8,500 to 9,000 patent examiners at any one time, and they become highly specialized. And one thing to keep in mind is that your, your patent attorney or agent is going to be more of a generalist. Um, maybe they have the luxury of specializing specifically in mechanical devices or electronic devices or something like that. But uh, it, until you get to your patent examiner, um, your patent examiner is going to be the, probably the, the, the person who's closest to you in the level of sophistication and familiarity with the technology. Your, your patent attorney is going to be a generalist, and many of the people that you, you meet along the way are, are going to be less knowledgeable than, than you are. Um, we don't route cases based on geography in any way. We route them strictly based on technology. When the regional office system was set up, one idea that was proposed was to specialize the different offices. For example, the Detroit office would presumably deal with automotive-related applications. Um, and you know San Jose would deal with with more software related stuff, but for a variety of reasons, including um, the economy tanking right around the time that we began opening this, um, the the filings shifted, and so now we're sort of agnostic. So when we hire people in the regional offices, we hire them based on the same exact analysis and, and hiring needs uh, that we use when we're hiring in in um, headquarters. So that that makes for some interesting discussions around the break room because when, when I came in in Alexandria into the big fishbowl um, you know everybody that I knew was was like me and worked in computer software related technologies and stuff like that um, we have representatives from uh, every technology center that's sort of a high level organization uh, organizational structure in the Denver office so that means that we have chemical engineers having lunch and, and being friends with Electrical, mechanical, um, all, all kinds of folks. Question about yeah. that, actually. Um, as a patent examiner, do you get to pick where you're at, or do you just fill what um, areas are needed across the country? Well, I so I, I came in with. You get to work from home a little bit, too? Yeah. Like. Uh, no, I, ca I came into the patent <laughs> office with a. a computer engineering degree and an electrical engineering degree, and I'd never taken a class on databases or file systems <laughs> or anything like that, and that's exactly where they put me. Um, <laughs> they, they, they put you where the, where the needs are of the office at that time, right? So, so to go back to the previous example, right, you, you can't go to, to college and study beds and pillows, right? So <laughs> at, at some point, there's, there's learning that goes on when you're on the job. Now, you know, especially if we hire people in from, from industry and, and the patent office is their second or their third career, um, you know, we try and match them up based on their expertise and, and align that with the needs of the office, but um, generally we don't kind of have that luxury. And so basically we slot people into very high levels of classification, which is basically just based on their degree. So we have a whole, you know, a whole group, that technology center organization that I was referring to, that's basically all, for example, in Becky's case, that would be all chemists and chemies, um, and then we put all the computer engineers and electrical engineers sort of into another big bucket and, and mechies go into the, the, the third <laughs> bucket. So it's pretty, it's pretty rough and we expect people to kind of pick it up on the job. It's rare for examiners to change from one technology to another. We also refer to it as, as arts. Your art is the technology area that you work on. That goes back to the Constitution and the way that they used to refer to useful arts and sciences. Um, but it, it does happen. You know, filings change, technology changes. What you're examining when you come in uh, is very different than what you're going to be working on 30 years down the line, um, whether that's because a technology that you're working on goes away entirely and you just have to learn something new or because of just the evolution, um, uh, it, it, it sort of depends. So, you know, examiners, you gotta be able to, you know, pick things up and familiarize yourself with things um, when you're on the go pretty quick. How many applications are put in a year? 
Uh, no. Ooh. Half a million? Yeah, approximately, yeah. How many? Half a million Lots. to a million, somewhere in that ballpark, roughly. Yeah, we got it on, a, on another slide deck that I'm giving later. <laughs> so I realize we jumped a little ahead into questions, but um, we've got about less than 30 minutes left, I think, with you guys. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I would kind of like to direct it more towards that question and answer session. And, all right, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to just open it up broadly for the next 15 or 20 minutes and talk pretty openly about patents, the process. Uh, this facility has filed and received probably close to 30 patents in its uh, history in the facility. Show of hands, who's filed a patent? Who's ever filed a patent application in the room? I mean, well, Lisa, you, you've been involved. Who else? A provisional, yeah. provisional or patent application. Who, who's thought about doing it? I mean, people have ideas. And, I mean, several of us have ideas. <laughs> So, you know, what we're really working towards as we're building this entire process out here, part of what we're building in university strategic initiatives is an innovative and a creative culture. So we're trying to take our assets that we've got at Pittsburgh State University and in the region uh, and use those things to help the people use the tools to be able to advance their ideas and advance things they want to try and pursue. So really what I want to see is I want to see Using that mindset, what ideas would you have or what ideas would you need to try and get some, you know, uh, information on? Um, when I think about how we file patent applications, it's a difficult process. I'm not a scientist. I'm more a business development guy. Uh, I have a lot of ideas. I want to file patent, provisional patent applications. I've never had the time to do that. <laughs> so some of the things I'm seeing this morning on the fast track and some of the resource wise, mm -hmm. I want to have an idea of how I can get to you guys quicker to get the information and understand how do we get into a fast track process so that we don't have to end the cost. The cost is the other big thing. I think cost has been prohibitive for a lot of people that's in at least this part of the, the state and this region. They just don't have the financial backing to be able to, to go after a patent. So what kind of best practices and tips and those kind of things could we talk about for a few minutes? Um. Yeah, well, so first off, uh, I like we were talking about earlier, I really think the track one program is a good idea that, you know, that I think that it might cost a little more money up front, but since it, you know, the prosecution hopefully doesn't go on for as long, right. I'm, I'm, I, I'm hopeful that that cuts your cost down. There's other ways that you can have your application be granted, it's called special status. So if you track one, you're, you're basically, you know, paying to move to the front of the line. Um, however, there, there's other considerations. For example, if one of the inventors is over the age of 65, uh, it can be moved into that pile. Um, there's a couple other <laughs> more. Well, yeah, you <laughs> might understand why. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's other sorts of, uh, of things like that. And, and sometimes there's, um, uh, there, there's none that are, are that active right now, but for example, uh, under, uh, there, there's been times when, for example, green tech related patents get um, the ability to, to move to the special pile. After September 11, 2001, there was an initiative to get Homeland Security related patents expedited um, and those kinds of things. The most recent one was part of the previous administration's Cancer Moonshot initiative. Uh, so, you know, this administration is, is, uh, has not yet appointed a permanent person to head the, the patent office, but um, once, uh, once that happens shortly, then we expect um, some, some additional direction on some of those age, uh, administration priorities and, and you know, uh, maybe some of the research that's being done here will be consistent with, um, with that. Uh, in terms of other resources that are available, if cost is prohibitive, I would certainly recommend getting in touch with the uh, local chapter of the patents pro bono program. Um, we can get you that information. Um, yeah, I, I think take my card, shoot me an email. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a gateway. Yeah, gateway. so the PTO yeah. acts as a clearinghouse. And, and so different states and cities and regions um, will have their, their intellectual property bar association, their patent attorneys get together and, and really organize that. So 
the, the PTO for a variety of reasons took a little bit of a, of a hands-off approach to the, the specific details and eligibility requirements and degree of services that are offered. Um, that varies based on where you are geographically. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so in, in some regions, and sorry, I'm not familiar with the particulars here, but in, in some areas it's more of a consultation service and they'll take a look at things and then when it comes to filing it, you're, you know, sort of on your own. In others, they provide the, the whole slew of legal services as if you were a paying client of theirs. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's another resource. Um, where you live <laughs> in so it's going to depend on whether or not you qualify for any of those various discount categories. But it would be uh, uh, to file a non-provisional application would be uh, typically about a, a couple thousand dollars. Um, you can get it down close to a thousand if you qualify as, as a micro entity. The non-provisional applications, like I said, are designed to be pretty cheap. That's a couple hundred bucks. Um, there's no real, so it's, it's hard because there's no real upper limit, right? So if you do have an application that's pending for, unfortunately, for eight years in some cases, um, then there, there are certain fees that you would need to pay to, to keep that alive. You, we, you, go through, you go through what we call several rounds of prosecution and there's fees associated with that. Then there's also going to be fees on the back end. So before you get that patent, right, you'll get a letter from your examiner to say what's called a notice of allowance. And that says, okay, we're all ready to give you a patent. Everything is in order here. We're happy about the, the scope of the, the protection that we've granted you, you know, this negotiation process that we've discussed has concluded and the office is satisfied and we're ready to give you a patent. Okay, by the way, you need to give us some money. Um, and so that, that's, that's the payment for us to, to go through the printing process and finalize everything and, and finally grant those, those property rights. So, um, you know, I would say from, from beginning to end, all told, you'd be looking at uh, less than $10,000. Um, uh, attorney's fees would probably push that over yeah. well, over the ten thousand. That's not right? really including. I, I'd say in I terms think. of the patent office fees, it'd probably be more like you know, things go well, four to five thousand dollars in fees to the patent office, uh, depending on your discounts and everything like that. And if you hire an attorney, the bulk of your costs, like I said, are going to be attorney's fees and not fees that you pay to the patent office. One thing that I'll say when we're on the topic of of how expensive this is, and I know it's not cheap. Um, the patent office is a fee-funded agency. So unlike basically every other federal agency with the exception of the IRS and some smaller agencies that you may not have heard of, um, we, we're, we're funded entirely by user fees. So that, that money that you pay, um, you know, that basically is going to pay your examiner for the amount of time that he or she's working on your, your application. Um, and then, you know, the overhead and the support of people like me who don't make the office any money anymore. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the patent office, and, and historically the, the, the Congress has actually sort of taken money um, from the patent office. That's shifted now and uh, we more or less, we get to keep most of what it is that, that we make. But, but your, your money's not just sort of going into a, a, a black hole or, or, you know, paying for... Um, you know, Congress people to fly around the country or whatever it is that they do with tax money. So, a little perspective there. Right. Questions? Yes. Go on. Uh, is, it, is it still a good idea to file a provisional if some researcher has already presented the work or published in some journal or somewhere? So ultimately, that's a business decision and a legal decision that you would want to make depending on your particular needs. So with that caveat, um, we, we are under a, a modified first to file system here in the US, right? So if you presented or published in the past year, um, then there should be no problem uh, getting uh, a, a US patent, assuming, you know, you and overcome all the other legal hurdles and you invented it and it's not obvious and all those kinds of things. But uh, yeah, there, there's, no, there's no problem with, um, with filing something, you know, after it's been published already. Um, but when we talk about best practices, best practices would, would probably dictate um, filing the application before publication. So, so if a researcher publishes 
see, let's say September, uh, and files a provisional in December, uh, does he or she get a year from September or from December? Sorry, what were the two things? In September? He publishes. Publish, publish presents in December? Uh, no, in, in December wants to find a oh. provision. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I don't see any problems. Theoretically, yeah. we haven't advocated that you should publish before you file. So sometimes it happens. Right, so right. When is your year start? So he's asking. When you it's file. It's public disclosure. Yeah. So right. it would start when you publish or when you present. When the article is public, when the okay, journal yeah. publishes. Or you not when you submit to the journal. Submitting to the journal. Yeah. would probably not be considered a public disclosure. It would be, you know, that month it's when, when, it's when the article yeah. comes out. Um, or if you first present at a conference, it would be the, the day in the conference on which you present. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to find anything more than, a, you know, the three-day range that the conference is taking place or something like that. But it usually doesn't come down to a matter of days, although sometimes it, it, it certainly does. Um, you know, the, one of the things to keep in mind for, for those of you who work in the, the labs here, I feel like, uh, and again, I apologize for not being more knowledgeable of the particulars of your industry, but I feel like there's a lot of manufacturing of, of these kinds of um, products that would take place overseas. And so, you know, that international filing would come into that. And like I said earlier, um, some countries are not as forgiving when it comes to those deadlines um, as, as the U.S. is. Does that answer your question? What about submitting a proposal? You have an idea and you're submitting a proposal. Proposal within your institution? Research, a research proposal. I mean, you're not going to know all the, how, the outcomes of that. Research, no, you're, you're, put your ideas in there. Is that considered public? Who, who are you well, submitting, submitting it to? Submitting it to the Oh, oh, as a potential grant kind uh, of okay. situation? Okay. Scope of, scope of work or something yeah. of that nature. So, a uh, researcher here has an idea, sets down, writes a you know writes a general statement, scope of work, and then presents that to to a client or to a prospect company. So, in general, um, one thing that you're going to want to consider if you're talking to companies, for example, if you're shopping an idea around like that, would be um, non-disclosure agreements. Right. And so that's something to work with your, your lawyers on. But you know if uh, Typically, we, we discuss this to, to small startups, you know, who are seeking funding and things like that. So would that protect our interest at that point? Because we do do a lot of those. We do non-disclosures and mutual disclosure agreements. When people first come in to start to talk about ideas, then we would generate a proposal and send that back to them and say, we believe we can do these things, knowing that we have the possibility of, in, of inventing something at that point. Would that be protection enough? Um, yeah, yeah, typically, yes. Yeah. Um, that, that, again, that, that would be the best practice that I think most... Like, you know, what, what, I'm sorry. What Sarah is asking is that somebody sends a proposal for federal funds. Yeah. And, and it, is it a public disclosure in some sense? I don't know. Is, that, is there a way that you can look up those things? I mean, so it's probably FOIAable, Freedom of Information Act request, but that's still sort of different than... It, I'm not being familiar with the, the agency's processes. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I think any said if they have a box you can check that says this is intellectual property within this application. So I would assume in that situation, I wouldn't assume. I, I I'd be careful. So so that's also at that point. It sounds like you're you're talking about. Um, a proposal for something that uh, it would be nice to be able to do, right? You have yet to actually invent the the new technology that it would actually be the thing that's invented, right? You, you're saying that I could, I could, I believe that if we're given X dollars and X amount of time, we can create um, a, a substance that falls within these specifications that you're requesting, right? Some of the time, some of the narrative will include things that we've invented here. As as a rule, you want to be careful about anybody you tell anything, including other federal agencies. Um, you know, uh, 
like uh, this gentleman's attorney advised him, um, you know, who have you told? And you know, presumably then the follow-up question, have you told anybody, would be, is, are you prepared to kill them, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, but like, uh, it, it, you, you probably at least want to loop in, you know, your your attorneys before you, you do it. I, and and I, I couldn't really advise you on the particulars not knowing what the, the government's willing to do in those situations. There, there's an important concept in, in patent law which is called reduction to practice. And so that's the time that you actually sort of get the thing working on your bench. And, and that's less important now under this first to, um, first to file system, but it's still a, a relevant question. And so, you know, if you're just saying, I think I could do this, um, please provide me the funds to, to, to take a stab at it. Um, it would be pretty hard to argue that you've already invented it at that point, but uh, that, that's a, a thorny thicket. Well, it was told to me, first question was, who did you tell? Second was, are you sure you didn't tell your kids or your wife or your friends or your neighbors? I mean, the idea has to be in here to the paperwork before you start. If you don't do that, you're going to have all kinds of partners. Everybody you told is going to claim a part of that idea. Yeah. So. And so what's what's tied up in this too is the idea that what you may think is sort of one invention or, or one you know discovery, um, from a legal standpoint, it, there may be a whole bunch of inventions that are wrapped up in there. So so the the actual compound might be be novel, but there might be. Um, a variety of different uses for it. And, and again, I'll put a big sort of caveat on this. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a question to, to have with your attorneys. Um, but, you know, it, what, what you think of as one invention or one discovery might actually be, a, a, might give birth to a whole number of patent applications to cover different aspects of it, right? Like to return to the smartphone example, um, you know, there's, depending on how far you get down into the chemical vapor deposition that takes place to create the integrated circuits, you know, there's, there's probably thousands of patents that are involved in the manufacturing and, and distribution of, of a, a smartphone these days. What's the difference between a divisional and continuation in part? Difference between a divisional and continuation in part. So, you want to take this? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a divisional application uh, goes back to this idea that we were just discussing about how um, uh, there may be multiple inventions in a legal sense that are contained in a single application. So you file your, your application. The, one of the most important parts of it is what's known as the claims. Um, just like you would have a deed to a piece of real estate that defines the four corners of, of the property so that a surveyor could come and, and mark them off and tell you whether or not somebody's standing inside your property, whether they're trespassing or not, right? Um, there's a similar analog in patent law, and that's called claims. But since you're doing it for intellectual property, where rather than being, uh, you know, geometry on the surface of, of the planet, we're talking about defining... Uh, the scope of property in the entire um, you know space of everything that could be invented, uh, we do it in in sentence form. So your claims are basically one big long run-on sentence, which define the meets and bounds of the intellectual property that you're protecting. And so when you negotiate with your examiner, that's typically what you're going to spend the vast majority of your time talking about is the scope of these claims, right? Um, and so you'll typically file a bunch of claims in your patent application. And your examiner may come back to you with what's known as a restriction requirement. And the examiner may say, you know, you filed 10 claims. There's actually three different inventions that are in here. One is towards a novel chemical compound, and one is towards, you know, uh, a lubricant that's used in this specific domain or something like that, right? And so what, what we're going to require you to do, the patent office is going to require you to do, is actually pick one of those three inventions and pursue it in this application. And you can file two more applications. That's a division. Those would be called divisional applications, and those would go to different examiners probably, and those would get examined separately because legally speaking, they're different inventions. Um, and so that's where a divisional comes in. A continuation. And so you can. There's a. What you're discussing generally is known as continuing applications. So like we were talking about in the context of, of PCT applications. 
they give birth to child applications. Well, your US application can give birth to many child applications, and you can have a very complex family tree, as it were, of patent applications all drawn to the same specification, all based on the same description of the technology. Um, and so there's continuing, regular continuing applications, there's divisional applications, and there's continuation in parts. So normally you can't add any new substance to your patent application once you've filed it. You're locked into the subject matter that you got when you dropped it in the mail on that first day. This is why this transition from provisional application to non-provisional applications becomes tricky. Um, and and you're, as much as possible, you're going to want to avoid adding anything new. Um, you, know, you can restate things, you can, you, know, uh, you can rearrange things, you can clarify what's there, but you don't want to add anything new. The one exception to that is going to be this continuation in part or CIP application. And what that allows you to do is to say, okay, you know, here's all this stuff that we, we disclosed previously. Um, you know, we, we did some more work and we found uh, this new and interesting result or this, this you know, different, um, this modified version of the compound that also has these interesting properties. And we want to add in this new discussion of this new property or this new material that we found. And you would do that, one way of doing that would be in a, a, a continuation of part application. Continuation of part applications get tricky because you, then you're talking about multiple dates. And so um, you may lose the priority, we say, of that earliest date when you first drop that original application in the mail, and that, that your date might actually slide to when you add that new stuff in. It gets complicated, there's a lot of considerations that go with that. Um, continuation of part applications are more common in some areas of technology than others. Generally, you, I would say you want to avoid them if you can. Yeah. There's no inherent so, value in And sometimes you can't avoid it because right. you, you know, you develop your idea further, so sometimes it's necessary. All right, to try and keep it close on time, this gentleman right here's got a question. If you have filed a provisional application and then during the year following you had to meet an improvement, how do you protect the improvement? Do you file a new provisional application on the improvement? So typically, um, yes, you would file a, another provisional application, or you can jump right to the non-provisional application. You never have to do a provisional application, but mm -hmm. if you're if you're kind of iterating over a problem and you're 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 finding some promising avenues and you want to continue to to you know develop it, yes, that's one option is is file a second provisional application within that year of that first application. And you know, then when the time comes, you can kind of combine those two things in that non-provisional. The one key thing to keep in mind, though, is that earliest date, that first provisional application that you put in, you 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 probably want to file your non-provisional before that year period lapses. Filing multiple non uh, filing multiple provisional applications isn't going to extend the window out for that first one that you put in the queue. Um, if you don't need that technology anymore and you're done with that and you've moved on to something that's a lot better, then that's a decision that you would want to, you, you, could, you could make to voluntarily let that go abandoned after that one year period. And then you would be tolling from that second application. Great. All right, well, with respect to everybody's time, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank these guys for traveling here from Denver, Mark and uh, Rebecca. Thank you for having us. I think they've got a few more minutes before they're going to leave, so if you have a particular question you'd like to come up and address with them individually, uh, you didn't feel comfortable mentioning it in the group, please stop up here, ask your question. If you want to send it to me, I'd be happy to follow up with them as well. Uh, again, you know, for us, we're going down this path of trying to figure it out. For us, we've never had a technology transfer office, although we've done tech transfer for years. We don't have a patent office, although we've done patents successfully, not here in this facility, but across our campus. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, we're really building this culture here. So we're very much in a learning environment, but at the same time, we're in an active, productive environment as well. So we're, we're constantly learning on the fly. Yeah. So it's good to know we've got some resources like you guys, and we'll certainly be reaching out a lot more often and knowing you're available. And we, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in building tech transfer in, in the region. We've got some, some universities that do it really well. The U in Utah does it. Um, they have a really successful program. Looking at their model. Yeah, and, and
and so you know we we've got a lot of questions from groups like yours, and so we're working to build out a lot of those best practices and those materials. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe a year from now or so, we can we can have uh, another discussion and, and have some some more stuff to share from you as, as you're building your tech transfer. Right. Well, thanks for being here today. Thank you all for coming. Great. Thank you.